Hello, my name is Jonna Farnham. And I'm Aubrey Rumble. And today we will be presenting on the folding equations for degree six origami vertices. Over the next couple minutes, we will be discussing how we used calculus, linear algebra, and computational mathematics to successfully model how certain vertices with six creases fold and unfold. First of all, we should note that researchers such as Huffman and Tachi completed work on a degree four flat foldable vertex. They found simple equations that relate the folding angles to their folding speeds over time. Basically, if folding angles are P1, P2, P3, and P4, they found linear relationships between the tangent of the folding angles over two, as seen here in this model. This equation expresses an algebraic relationship between folding angles. We hope to do the same work, but for degree six vertex folds. Now the listed results correspond to the symmetric degree six origami vertex. The trifold has the symmetry where the folding angles alternate around the vertex, like P1, P2, P1, P2, and so on. And the folding angles P1 and P2 are captured by equation two. The bow tie has folding angle symmetry P1, P1, P2, P1, P1, P2. And the resulting parameterized equation captured in equation three shows an algebraic relationship between the folding angles P1 and P2. Lastly, we have the opposites with angle symmetry P1, P2, P3, P1, P2, P3. And the resulting parameterized equation shows an algebraic relationship between the folding angle P3 in terms of P1 and P2. To ensure we found all possible folding patterns, we used combinatorics and computational mathematics. From this, we found that the three we had, as well as the P1, P2, P3, P4, P3, P2 pattern, were the only possible rigid folding patterns. Working on specific results for symmetric and water bomb degree six vertices, we decided the next step would be to find equations that relate folding angles for general crease patterns, like the degree four case. Here we have three different crease patterns that correspond to a generalized trifold, two modes of a generalized bow tie, and also a generalized opposites, respectively. So the left one is for the generalized trifold, the middle one is for the generalized bow tie, and the right one is for the generalized opposites. The first generalized pattern we found an equation for is the generalized trifold pattern, which corresponds to the leftmost crease pattern in our folding pattern section. Equation five shows that there's an algebraic relationship between P1 and P2 based on angle B, and it's pretty gross as you can see. We also found two equations for the generalized bow tie, specifically mode one and two captured in the equations six and seven respectively. These both correspond to the center crease pattern in our folding pattern section. Clearly, we see that both of these show that there is, again, an algebraic relationship between P1 and P2 based on angle B. Lastly, we found equation seven for the generalized opposites pattern, which relates to the rightmost crease pattern. This equation is a little different as it finds an algebraic relationship between P1, P2, and P3 based on angles B and C. So this time we have two different angles that could affect the equation. Now I would like to show you the Mathematica manipulate for the generalized trifold. As you can see here, there's a slider for B, which changes the sector angle on the crease pattern. And then T2 is a folding angle, which will actually fold the paper. Since there's no tears occurring when we fold the paper, this means that our equation for our folding is valid. It should also be noted that in the computer program, our faces can intersect. However, this wouldn't happen in real life, so this does not affect the validity of our equations. This is mode one of the generalized bow tie, which again has an angle B slider, as you can see, which changes like in our poster. And again, T1 actually folds which demonstrates that we do have a valid equation. Similarly, here we have mode two of the bow tie, which also has an angle B as we saw in mode one, which changes, and then a slider to actually fold the paper. And again, this just proves that our equations we have are rigid folding equations.
Lastly, we have the generalized opposites pattern, which contains both angle B and angle C, which can be changed, as you can see here. And then in this case, we have two different angles which can fold the paper, um, T2 and T3. So as you can see here, we can fold that, which creates a book fold, and T3 folds it a different way. And since there's no tears, this again proves that we have a valid folding equation. So at this point, we have shown all of our results, but we have not yet shown the process of how we got them. So let's jump into that now. If we let our crease lines correspond to vectors from the origin, we can use Rodriguez's formula to create a function in terms of L sub i, our rotation matrix about the axis, and P sub i, our folding angle. We let bracket L sub i x denote the cross product matrix operator, where L sub i is the vector, and the superscript refers to the x, y, or z coordinate. Now, if I rotate each of my planes along each of their adjacent vectors, I'm equivalently multiplying their individual rotation matrices, which, if my paper does not rip, should equal the identity matrix, as we see um, in this section here. We should note that our folding angles are functions of time, since folding does not just happen, but rather takes an amount of time to achieve a fold. This is why we incorporate the variable t into our equations. There's a principle in rigidity theory that has been rigorously proven which says rigid motions are governed up to the second order. What this means for us is that we can approximate these motions with only the terms up to the second derivative in our Taylor approximation. So notice that the first term is the identity matrix i since f of zero is like plugging in a folding angle of zero implying no folding is done. So all other terms in our equation must equal zero since the entire function f of t is equal to the identity matrix. Now by the previously mentioned principle, we focus on the second order term at f double prime zero. And again, we know this must equal zero. Notice that the upper left term of the second order term matrix is the summation of the negative y coordinate of the ith crease times the y coordinate of the jth crease. In our equations, a is equal to the minimum of i and j, b is equal to the maximum of i and j, and p um, prime of zero are our folding speeds. Notice that the two matrices in the second order term are complementary, so each position in the matrix must sum to zero. Setting the left matrix sum terms to zero is how we end up generating our folding equations. From here, we also have a couple questions that we want to answer. One of them being what determines the value of the constant a in each of our equations. When we parameterize, we always use an, a, some sort of constant. We've seen that it's either been two or four. So we want to determine what makes that happen. We also want to investigate why the parameterization we use works. So we use the parameterization using tangent, but we want to know where that comes from from all the math. Lastly, we also want to see if we can prove that the generalized crease patterns we have are the only ones that are possible for their respective symmetries. We want to see how much of the configuration space we can actually carve out using these methods. Before concluding this presentation, we would like to thank our advisor, Dr. Thomas Hall, for his continuous support, along with the NSF, for allowing this research to be done. Thank you for your time, and we look forward to answering any questions you might have during the live portion of this poster session.